Welcome to Bear Creek. If you are here, would you stand? Let's get ready to worship the Lord. That's going to have his way and his will in us today. Amen. That's our prayer. So let's sing that today. Come on. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom That's our prayer and our desire as we begin this moment of worship is that his will would be done in us, amen. It all belongs to him. It's all created for, for him and by him. That's what First Colossians says. And so our desire for today is to say, Lord, have your way in us, to put him in the highest place above everything, amen. Say, Lord, there will be no other God before you. You're first, you're first in everything. So would you help me with your hands today? As we continue to see, and we continue to make Christ first. We say there will be no other God before you. Sing this. Yahweh, Yahweh, holy is your name, and I don't want to take it in vain. Yahweh. Take it in vain. There will be no other God before you. And there will be no other God before you. There is no one above you. There is no one above you. No one beside you. Nobody like you. There will be no other. 
heart of today is for us to say God there will be no other God before you there is nobody like you no one can take your place you're above it all amen and so we're so excited that you're here to join us and to join in that same idea and that same desire as together as a church body as Bear Creek and so we're so glad to see you this morning do me a favor turn to the person next to you greet them tell them that you're also glad to see them here in the, in the house of God Good morning, everyone. Welcome. You can be seated. Man, we are here to worship the one that uh, has no rival, and that is the Lord God who created us, who created the universe, who loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And I want you to feel that and experience that this morning as we, as we go through this experience of worship, just lifting him up, that he can take every burden, that he can take every challenge, 
He can take everything you face and he, and he can uh, work through it for your good. And so I'm grateful uh, that you're here. Hey, if you're new to Bear Creek, we're especially saying to you, welcome. We're so uh, grateful that you are here. In fact, Bear Creek family, welcome those. Why don't you welcome those that are new? <laughs> welcome to the Labor Day weekend, right? And I uh, hope you have a great experience uh, tomorrow, just hopefully resting. But if you're new, if you want to let us know that you're here, we would love that. You could... Uh, Grab a welcome card that's in a seat back in front of you and fill that out and drop it off uh, at our info desk or welcome desk. And if you do that, we have a great gift for you as well. If you'd rather do that digitally, you can see how to do that on the screen there. Uh, but we just want you to know that you're special to us uh, and we, we want to be your family. So um, I have something important to ask you to pray for and then to be here for and to invite someone to. And that's starting next week. I'm going to begin a brand new teaching series that's called uh, Find Your Courage. I mean, I don't know. Do you feel it? The, the level of anxiety and frustration and anger that's just kind of swirling all around us. I mean, is it creeping into you uh, uh, as well? Do you know that all three of those are fear responses? And there's really only one answer. I mean, expressing those, none, none of those three actually fix, fix anything that you face. There's really only one answer, and that is to find your courage. And I know the source for giving you the greatest courage you could possibly uh, imagine. And I want to teach that through the fall. And it'll be a Excellent opportunity for you to invite those that maybe you know who don't know Christ, because I'm going to share the gospel, I think, in a clear and compelling way each time. And so I hope you'll be ready for it. Pray for it. Be here. Invite someone to come uh, as well. committed to give to God to advance the gospel because we know that God is in the people's business. He wants to reach as many people as possible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we want to be on that team because there are many people out here that need to hear the gospel of Christ so that God can be glorified, his son can be magnified, and the people can be edified. The thing I'm most excited about, first things first, is the opportunity that we get to spread the gospel overseas, internationally, and also here in the local community. Si tú quieres ser parte de todo lo que está haciendo el Señor Jesucristo aquí en Houston, sus alrededores, y sobre todo aquí en el área de Katy, te invito a que formes parte de Primero es lo Primero. El Señor está haciendo grandes cosas en nuestra comunidad, en nuestras vidas. Te invitamos a que nos apoyes en esto y pongas a Dios de primero en tu vida. Pon de primero a Dios en todo. Te esperamos en Bedford.
Únete a Primero lo Primero. Amen. So, just like that video said, what is our commitment to make Christ first in our lives and in our church look like? What well, looks like those things? Humility, surrender, total, complete self-abandonment, worship to the Lord, obedience, our faithfulness, our giving, our generosity. And so we're going to continue in this time of worship with our generosity by the giving of our tithes and our offerings. So I'm going to call our ushers forward. And uh, I would ask you to stand in this moment as we pray and as we bring this to the Lord in this moment now, as we make him first, and then we'll continue on in worship. So Father God, you are above all things. You are worthy of all of us, everything, God. Not just the little things, not just our finances, not just a few hours on Sunday, but everything, God. So in this moment now, we want to be able to bring that to you in obedience, in our faithfulness to you, and in our commitment to make you first and our church's commitment to make you first Lord. so I pray that you'd be glorified that you'd be exalted in this time by our, our lives through our lives and our giving we truly love you it's in Jesus name that we pray these things amen and amen Oh, 
keep the first thing first. Would you pray with me this morning, church? Lord, this is our response, Lord, to seek you, to turn our eyes away from earthly things and fix them on you, Lord, to seek your will and not our own, to surrender our selfish, our sinful desires and pursue your ways and your will for our lives, for our church, for our city, for our world, for our nation. That's what we want. Nothing else, Lord. So God, we know that the path to that is full surrender, is full commitment to you, Lord. It's to come and lay it all down before you, all our pride, all our selfish desires, and say we want you and nothing else. So God, we wanna seek you today as we dive into your word, into your scripture. I pray that you would give us that hunger for you and for you alone. That we go closer to be more and more like you. Come be the ruler of our lives. Come be the Lord of our lives. We truly love you and we worship you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. You know, we are in a really incredible time in the life of our fellowship. Like, I have never seen in all of my years of following Christ since a young teenager, just this atmosphere, this environment is just so completely different. And there's nothing that explains it. There's nothing strategically that explains it. There's nothing organizationally that explains it. It's just the presence of God moving in, in ways that I've never seen before. And, uh, and let me just tell you two really quick stories out of a hundred that are just out of this last eight months or ten months. Maybe you've heard about these, maybe not, but so there's a young there's a young woman who um, uh, is from a very strict Muslim family, but she came to a, an event at Bear Creek and had never heard the gospel before, and, and so she heard it and was just stunned by the grace and mercy and love of God, and it just got in her, and she couldn't stop thinking about it, and she kept coming back and asking questions, and and she asked for a New Testament, read the whole New Testament, and just kept thinking about it and being drawn, and God's Spirit was just drawing her. And she finally sat down with some believers here in our church and said, I, I want to follow Christ. And, and they said, are you sure in, in the midst of your environment, are you sure you want to do that? And, and she said, of course, yes, I do. And she knew what it would cost her. And she prayed to receive Christ. She put her faith in Christ. She was bold enough to say to her family, I've just asked Christ into my life. And they did what she expected that they would do. They rejected her. And I mean, they threw her out of their home. And some of you who know her, uh, you gathered around her and did exactly what believers do. You began to meet every need in her life. There came a moment several weeks later that she said, I want to be baptized. And you know, that's a public profession of faith. That's you going public and saying, I follow Jesus. And, and so we ask, are, are you sure? Is, are there safety issues? And she said, yes, there are safety issues, but I still want to be baptized. And so we took all the precautions we could. She didn't take any precautions. And, uh, um, and we baptized her here before you. 
uh, on one of those days where we were baptizing 15 and you didn't exactly know who she was. What an incredible thing for her to follow Christ. Just, that's one story of a hundred. Here, here's a, another just in the last few months. So uh, a young man who was a full-on Satanist, I mean, the evidence is still on his arms, all of the Lucifer uh, d- tattoos. Um, and so he told me that, that he would stop at the stoplight here at the intersection, and he would look over here, and he would have the most contemptuous thoughts about this place and whoever it was that was inside this, this place. And one, one definite thought he had over and over and over is that I will never in all of my life ever step into that place. And through a series of truly miraculous events, he stepped foot in this place. And he heard the gospel. And, and he, heard, he heard, he was stunned by the mercy and grace and love of God for him. And he couldn't shake it. And it got in him. And he melted, it melted his heart. And he came to ask Christ into his life. And he too, just a few months ago, right up there, was baptized. And that's two stories. Listen, that's two stories of a hundred more in these past months. We've seen more people come to Christ in the last eight months than we've seen in any season ever in the history of our church. I mean, we've seen the largest number of people in our churches, more than 40-year 40 40 history, go public with their faith and be baptized in just the last year or several months. In fact, next Sunday, we'll celebrate that a little bit. And listen, I'm telling you all of that why. Because I think there's a reason for it. And as I've already said, the reason is not organizational, and the reason is not some strategy. I think the, re- the, the reason for it, I want to raise up in front of you. And I want to call you to it in your family, to be it in your family, and at work, and school, and in your neighborhood, and our community. And here it is. Uh, here it is. I'm going to read it to you. Jesus, and what I'm about to read to you, Jesus is naming you. He's giving you an identity and showing you the influence that you are simply by being a follower of his, by being his follower. And so it's out of the passage that we've been teaching over the past, now this is the third week, the final week, and that is verse 14. I'm going to pick it up in Matthew 5, verse 14. You, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does one light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16, let your light shine before others in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. This word has power because it's the word of God. And it has the power to change us if we open ourselves to it. And I want you to see the idea that's coming out of the heart of Jesus into your life and this moment. Here's the idea of this passage, the idea of this message, and that is this, that God has made you light. He has made you light to influence your world, to fill your own life, and to make him shine all around you. And I want to describe that over the next few moments. In fact, here's the question. I mean, you may be asking it. Okay, if he's made me light, in what way am I light? I don't feel like light. And so, in what way am I light? I mean, what is the light that is shining out of me if I am a follower of Christ? And I want to describe that light, and I want to define it in three ways. And so listen to the first. What is that light? Number one, Jesus is telling us here in this teaching, Jesus is telling us that this light is the light of your life. It's the light of your lives. And so he says it there, verse 14, 
you are the light of the world. That's in parallel with what he just said in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. And, and next to that, you are the light of the world. He means those as these are your influences. These are the parallel influences of your life. If you have allowed the gospel to come into your life, if you're allowing it to change who you are, if you've embraced me as the Lord and leader uh, of your life, then the light is the salt and light uh, 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 shining out of you. And so this is the gospel shining out of your lives in two ways. First, it's the gospel lived. Listen for that. In a second, I'm going to say it's the gospel shared. So listen for the, it's the gospel lived, and then secondly, it's the gospel shared. And so, so it's the gospel lived, and that's what verse 13 is. You are the salt of the earth. And we've already made the point, this is the influence of your character. This is you drawing close uh, uh, to, to, to the needs all around you and being the, the healing, preserving influence all around you. And Jesus is saying this um, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Where did he say this? Well, he's saying it in the Sermon on the Mount. And I wish theologians would have thought about it a little more deeply before they named this sermon, because I think it is the worst descriptor of this sermon that could ever be. I mean, what is this sermon? This, this sermon should be called, it, it ought to be called uh, the, gospel, the Sermon of the Gospel Life. This sermon should be called, uh, the, this is how the gospel changes who you are sermon. Because that's what Jesus is doing in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He's describing, if you embrace me, if I become the Lord and leader of your life, the gospel comes in you and begins to transform you. Chapter 5, 6, and 7, this is how your life changes. And in fact, uh, Matthew 5 through 7 describes the light. I mean, if you want to know what the light is that's in your life that should be shining out, Matthew 5 through 7 describes it. In fact, it catalogs it. In fact, I'm going to take the risk of just walking through this catalog because I want you to see what should be light coming out of your life. And it's the Sermon on the Mount that describes it. And so, let me just do that for a moment. Listen, uh, listen to this. And so, this is how your life will begin to look and light will begin to shine out of your life when, number one, you begin to admit your own spiritual need and become desperate for God's mercy and grace to enter into your life. I've just described the Beatitudes, the introduction to this message. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit and everything that follows. It describes a hunger and thirst for God's grace and his mercy in you, and an acknowledgement. I mean, I mean, just seeing yourself for who you actually are, the poverty, the spiritual poverty that's in you. And then, and then you'll start become, you'll start becoming a healing and shining influence instantly. You'll start becoming a salty and light-filled influence instantly. And others will, well, over time, others will come to want what you have. Then you'll begin rejecting some stuff in you. You'll begin rejecting selfish anger and lust and contempt for others and a deceitful heart and this, the tendency you feel toward retaliation. I'll get even with you, right? And then, and then you'll begin embracing, I'm just walking through the Sermon on the Mount here, then you'll begin embracing a life of self-giving love. I, I have to call it that in our generation. You know, right, uh, if you read the word love in the Bible, it means self-giving love, but that's not really what it means in our culture. Most of the love in our culture is very self-centered. It's actually really self-centered uh, uh, love, and so we have to say it's a, it's a specific kind of love. It's a kind of self-giving that flows out of you, and that describes your relationship to your friends, and that describes your relationship to strangers, and it describes your relationship to enemies. You'll begin to rip all of the hypocrisies out of your life and, and just start seeking to live a life that doesn't pretend that you are what you are not and that you are more than what you actually are. You'll just rip, you'll start ripping those hypocrisies out of you. 
You'll start rejecting the pursuit of money as the most important thing in your life, as the God in your life, as the most meaningful thing in your life. And you'll, and you'll cause it. You'll make it stop controlling you. And, and you'll make it serve you. And, and the new desires that you have in your life to follow Jesus and, and to follow after the things of God. Then you'll stop worrying and obsessing about all the bad things that might happen. Might happen. You'll grow a settled confidence that, that your father is taking care of you. And then, chapter 7, you'll begin wanting Christ to be the source of all of your real life needs. It's why Jesus, in, in, in Matthew 7, it's why when he talks about prayer there, every other sentence is ask. Why don't you ask? Just ask. Keep on asking. Why don't you seek? Seek me for it. Why don't you keep on seeking? Knock. Keep on knocking. Ask. Let me be the source of all of your needs. That's what, this is what your life begins to transform into. And Jesus even gives a conclusion to it. He's saying, look, look, if you do this or if you don't do it, I can tell you what your life will be. If you do it or you don't do it, I can tell you what your life will be. He says, if you enter this life, you'll be like a house built on a rock foundation. No storm can destroy you. It can wail against you, beat against you, but you will stand. But if you don't enter this life, he said, you'll be like a house built on a sand foundation you can be dismantled and destroyed by any storm in any moment. And so it's living, listen, what is, what is the light? It's living out this life uh, that gives you a healing influence in the lives of others all around you. And so that is the gospel lived, but it is also the gospel shared. And that's what he means when he, when he says in parallel to salt, you are light. You are light. The light shining out of you is you sharing with others that the gospel is the power of God that has rescued you from so much. The light is this, is this life shining out of you. It means that everything that Christ did on the cross that has had this life-changing effect in you, I mean, you were captive to so much, but Christ rescued you. And he rescued you mostly from just the darkness that you were living in and that was in you. And, and so the light is this, you saying to, to, to someone else, when I came to Christ, he changed me so much. He rescued me from so much. He forgave me of so much. He healed me from so much. He's, giving, he's given me light and life and I want you to have it too. That's light radiating out of you. And so what is this light? If he says you are light, what is it? It, it, is, the, it is the life you live. It is the light uh, shining out of your life. But there is a second. And the second is this. It's the light of a city. Which honestly shouldn't make sense to you at the moment. I mean, I'm saying it. And I'm saying it the way that Jesus said it. But, but it's not really meant for it to make sense sense to you in the very first moment. It's the light of a city. So look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. He goes on to say, you don't light a lamp and put it under a basket. You put it on a lampstand. These are all references to light, 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 light. And so let your light shine, he says in verse 16. And so his metaphor is tight and compact and, and clear and concise. You are light. Except, except right in the middle of it, he inserts this I, it's not nonsensical, but it just, doesn't, it, it just doesn't fit there. It doesn't seem to fit there. A city setting on a hill can't be hidden. Well, of course that's true. But what does he mean by that? He's telling you something so profound, so important, so incredible. First of all, for a city to set on a hill in the ancient world would be really unusual. So it would be an unusual sight. Because 
Cities typically weren't built up. They were actually built low. They were built, you know, they were built in, in harbors or they were built at the base of mountains in order to protect them from, you know, all of the elements, the severe elements. Also, cities were built, you know, by rivers and water sources down low so that they would, uh, they would have water. Almost never built up, built up on the top of a mountain. So it would be an unusual site. That's the first thing that Jesus means. But, but he also means, and it relates completely to light, but at night. In an ancient world where there's no harnessed electricity, no light bulbs, an ancient city on a plateau, an ancient city on a hill, an ancient city at night would shine like a lighthouse in the darkness of no light at all. But he says it's a city. This is what's important. This is why. Jesus keeps using second person plural when he says you. Over and over when he says you are salt, he, he means second person plural, everyone I'm speaking to. Uh, he says it again when he means light. He, when he keeps saying you, he's using the second person plural. And so that confuses us a little bit, right? So, you know, the English language in the Northeast uh, is confusing, right? Because they don't have a word for second person plural, Right? I mean, Southern English is more nuanced and more sophisticated than English in the Northeast because we have a word for second person plural. It's its own distinct word. When we say you, meaning you all, we, we have this contraction. It's nuanced. It's sophisticated. It is y'all. And that's what Jesus is saying. Y'all are the salt of the earth. Y'all are the light of the world. Let your, all of your light shine in such a way. And so when he calls it a city, he's saying, listen, it's not just the light of your individual candle, your individual light. It is the light of your community. It is the light of the city that you are, the community of Christ. That's what's important. It's, it's, the, not the, it's not the power of one candle. It's the power of a thousand candles or a hundred thousand candles or a million candles. You're the city. Jesus is saying, you're that city on the hill. And he's saying this light shines most powerfully when it comes out of all of you at once. He's telling you that it's a kind of supernatural community that you are. The city on a hill means you are a supernatural community that makes the most powerful witness uh, uh, from the light he brings into your lives. I mean, he's telling you, you are a culture within a culture. Your counterculture. I mean, doesn't it feel radical to be a part of a counterculture? You're, that's you as the city on the hill. I mean, it's the other culture in our society that owns the media, right? It's the other culture that the elite all, you know, gather around. It's the other culture that owns academia. It's the other culture that controls entertainment. And, and, and they're all powerful influences but Jesus, in the face of that, looks in your faces, you all's faces, and he says, but you have salt, and you have light, and there is one that is more powerful than the other. There is one culture more powerful than the other, and I'm going to tell you which it is, and I'm going to illustrate it from the New Testament church. The New Testament church started after Jesus' resurrection with 120 unrecognized, uninfluential people who met in a little upper room. Nobody knew them. Nobody thought that they counted for anything. But then they began, listen to this, this is the power. They began to live out the gospel. I mean, embrace this, will you? They loved others like no other culture. I mean, right, you get that, that there is no major philosophy in Western culture that says you should, that you should love as radically as Christians do. I mean, right? 
right? You're, you're, you're proud that, you know, you know Nietzsche and, you know, you embrace Nietzsche. Well, he was such a nihilist and he thought life was meaningless. Maybe it's, maybe it's Bertrand, maybe, maybe it's Jean-Paul Chart. Uh, all of these secular Western uh, philosophers, none of them said love was important at all. Um, it's only Christianity that has risen up to say love is giving yourself away for the good of another. And they began to love like that. They fed the poor when no one else felt any obligation to it at all. There's no, there's no major Greek or, or Roman philosopher who would say that it's an obligation and it's important for you to take care of the poor and feed the poor. In fact, there's philosophical writing in, 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 in one Greek philosopher who said, yesterday I gave two coins to a beggar. I wasted that because I lost two coins and tomorrow he will be as destitute as he was yesterday. There's... There's philosophy that is loveless. And they cared, they, they cared for the sick and dying during pandemics. And, and I've shared that with you before, that when everyone else ran away, Christians gave up their lives to care for others knowingly that they were giving up their lives. And in fact, hospital care, compassionate mental care was born out of Christianity. Even even though poorer themselves in the first and second century, they bought others out of slavery and made them brothers and sisters in the fellowship of Christ. When 40% of the population were slaves, they, um, they saved babies, especially girls from the common practice in the Roman culture of taking an unwanted newborn and exposing them to the elements for them to die because they couldn't afford them or they didn't want them. And Christians would go and take them out of the elements and save them and raise them as their own children. And so much more. And so much more. But then, but then, here's what they noticed. Uh, these Christians, they died so peacefully, especially when they were executed for their faith. And it was the light of that community that turned the secular Roman culture, I mean, a, a culture of power, a culture of power, it absolutely turned it inside out, uh, not out, listen, it, it wasn't a political movement uh, that that caused Christianity to grow and flourish and explode in the Roman Empire. It was salt and it was light of the lives of Christians. And there are plenty who recognize that. Rodney Stark, sociologists, other scholars have to admit that because they've studied the documents. And that is you too. If you'll be who God created you to be, light. Now, let me give you the last. What is the light? It's the light of your life lived. It's the way you live your life. Secondly, it is the light of your witness. It's the light of the city. That's who you are. You are the city uh, on, uh, on the hill. But then, but then thirdly, it is the light of our vision, our city. We, who we are, who God has called us to be. It is the light of our vision. And so Jesus brings it to application in verse 16 when he says, let your light shine. He's saying, unobscure it. Let it shine. Let it shine before others in such a way that they see, they see your life, they see what you're doing, they see your acts of love, they see who you are, and they glorify God who is in heaven. The important phrase in that verse is, let, let your light shine in such a way. Let it shine in a focused way. Let it shine in a purposeful way. And that's our vision as a church, as a fellowship. I mean, it's, it's powerful language for us to say we want the light of the gospel to shine out of us. We're the city. I, I mean, look, I know all the greatest politicians have stolen our language, right? John Kennedy called America 
uh, a city on a hill in, in all of his speeches just before his inauguration. Ronald Reagan called America the shining city on a hill to communicate his vision uh, for America when he was the president and through the 1980s. I mean, I know all the best politicians steal our language, and they steal it for one reason. It's powerful. And the powerful, the powerful nature of it is, this is you. You're, you're the light. You're the city on a hill. And so, this describes our vision. What's a vision? A vision is the, is the agenda we see for the future. <laughs> the, the, a vision is our agenda that we see for the future. And, and we vision for our influence to expand, and we want our community and the world around us to see our life, our community life, our, our life as a congregation of the gospel and cause them to look up and to see how much God loves them and wants to redeem everything broken in their lives. And so even more sharp focused, and I'm going to say this, and I, I hope I say it in a minute or a minute and a half. Our vision is our agenda for the next two years, and it's in these three priorities. And I just want to stir this up uh, in you uh, before we pray, and that is to share the gospel through our ministry, to share the gospel through our ministry. Why? Why? Starting three years ago, going to five years into, in, into the future, the demographers are telling us in just the five-minute half circle, the five-minute half circle just to our west, and uh, uh, five mile, I'm, I meant to say five mile half circle to our west. In other words, inside of 10 minutes, just to the west of our church, 35,000 new, 35, new homes are being built. 35,000. That's 50 to 75, but let's just say it's 50,000 souls being brought to us, to our doorstep. And we owe them the light, the gospel. And we are focused for this next two years to be that light. And what is our need? Our need is to resource it with our generosity. There's a second. And the second is we vision to be the gospel in our community. And as you know, that God is just bringing people here in, in huge, huge numbers. Uh, a couple of Sundays ago, we had almost 3,000 people here. We think next week we'll have about 3,000 people here. We're in two worship venues. Our second, our smaller venue, one of those services is packed now. It's at its capacity now. And that's why we want to expand that space, just minimum. 3,000 square feet, and we can almost double our seating there and continue to share the gospel, be the gospel in our community. There's a third, and that is we vision to take the gospel to the world. We've got awesome mission partners who are sharing the gospel with the world, especially in Central and South America. We're partnered in El Salvador. We're partnered in the Dominican Republic. We're, we're now partnered in Cuba, and that is like phenomenal, the, the communist regime in Cuba, and, and we're coming in kind of under the radar and helping resource the gospel uh, there. Uh, we, want our, our, we want our influence to expand into the poorest parts of Houston, through the mission centers of Houston, all for the gospel. And we've, we've named our price. We want a million dollars in two years to flow out of this place in, in, into the gospel for the world. But what does it take for us to be the city of light? It's going to take radical generosity out of every one of our lives. And I'm telling you, the price is worth it to focus our hearts on being generous toward the things of God and being a part of the city of light that's shining the gospel all around us, it means, it, it means that we will see, I, I think we'll see in unprecedented numbers people come to know Christ and it's because of your light. I'm gonna ask us to bow together. And I'm gonna ask you to pray with me This is time for you to commit your heart to what the Lord has spoken into you, and, and so here it is. Would you pray three ways? 
you willing to follow me on this? Just pray three ways. First, God, I want the light of the gospel to shine out of my life. I want it to. And I know that comes with me embracing the life of the Sermon on the Mount. The gospel changing me, changing who I am over time so that the light shines brighter and brighter and brighter out of me. The second way to pray. God, I want to feel and know that I am a part of the city of light. That I am a part of the city on a hill. That as a church community that we are known for how much we love, how much grace pours out of us, how much we desire for people to know the love and grace and mercy of God. It's the third way to pray. I commit myself to the light of our vision as a church. And I invest myself into it. Because it's worth it. It is so worth it. It is the most valuable thing I could resource in my whole life. God, I ask you to do that in us. And we thank you for how much you love us. We pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you. Yeah, thank the Lord for these moments. Thank you for these moments. I want to invite you, this is very important, I want to invite you to our prayer areas at the back of this room. You have, if you feel any need at all, and I, I'm, I'm especially thinking about if you've never asked Christ into your life, but you would want to pray with someone about that, that's what these prayer areas are for. But also, any burden, any need, anything that you would appreciate someone praying with you about, that's... That's what these prayer areas are about. And I hope that you will go there and spend a moment there praying. Last word is this. As you leave, uh, there's going to be some really uh, great people who hand you just a little stack of invite cards. And these are an invitation to the series to come, Find Your Courage. And I hope you'll take it and just like put it in your car, your console, something, uh, so that if God gives you an opportunity, you could invite someone this fall to what we're going to experience and I think God's going to do some awesome stuff. Let's stand together. Father, thank you that you love us and thank you. Thank you for the light of the gospel that has shined into our lives and changed us. And God, we want to be that light to the community around us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. Thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm.